as we ponder upon the words that are being read. Can I hear the voice once more? Happy Sabbath, church. How many of us are happy today? Yes. Why? Because Sabbath is a happy moment. We all come together in the name of Jesus Christ, to wish each of us happy Sabbath. Am I right? Amen. And today we are privileged to say the same one to Jesus when he will come down from the New Jerusalem and say, invite us into the New Jerusalem and whereby we are going to see face to face Jesus Christ and how privileged we are going to be as we study the idea of New Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Morning. Am I right? Morning. I still want to say morning. If I say afternoon, I think many of us will feel hungry. So this morning, I'm happy because I'm here with you. Amen. I had the privilege of staying with you for a week, starting from last Sunday till today. 
sharing with you the core of Adventism and the last day's message that we need to share with all of us and that we may enjoy the happiest moment of following and being with Jesus Christ. And that's the happiness every Adventist member should have. That I represent India. We still have a kind of a worship, a kind of a fellowship, as we all have today here. And I'm proud that this Sabbath, I'm here with you. Usually, I don't stay in one church because of the work that is given to me. I have to go to every church, you know, on every Sabbath, promoting the personal ministries and see how all the members or the Adventist people belonging to different places cities and towns could be seen in heaven and God this time has given me an opportunity to spend some time with all of you in this part of the world and I hope the same fellowship the same joy and happiness we will have when we meet with Jesus Christ you know sometimes when our departmental people who come from the general conference, when they visit uh, India, uh, sometimes, you know, after the session is over, they will say, if we meet in heaven, just pinch me on the left side of my hand, then I will know that you are from India. <laughs> and I don't know what to say. If you and I meet in heaven, what would we say? High five. High five. <laughs> because if you pinch, it might pain. And Jesus says there is no pain in heaven. <laughs> Am I right? So high five would be the best mode of identifying me if we meet in heaven. So my dear brothers and sisters, this morning what a privilege God has given to each one of us that we as individuals are given the high rank of being with Jesus when he comes a second time. This morning, the church at study is going to do a study on the book of Revelation, chapter 21. And the church is going to study a book which I would rather say would be the last vision that was given to John the Revelator. A lot of visions he had lot of prophecies were given to him and lot of prophetical message that he gave to us and that we dealt with some and today I'm surely right and I'm 100% true that this is the last vision that God gave to John to tell the world to open the scriptures and to study the scriptures with people representing the truth that God has in it. And what a privilege that we have this morning to study on this very a clinical, a theological, a doctrinal study on 
New Jerusalem. Morning reading that we had. I, the John, was taken into a mountain. And God showed me a vision of a new land, of a new world, of a new place. And that is what? The new Jerusalem. Friends, I do not know how long you have been studying about this new Jerusalem and how you studied, to what extent it helped you and to what extent you have helped others by sharing, I'm not very sure. But I tell you, this is the last day's message given to the people who live in the last days, given to the people who are awaiting the second coming of Jesus Christ, who really want to be there, who really want to take others there, and that's the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. To teach, to practice, and to make sure that we take people into heaven. How long are we going to tarry here on this earth? How long are we going to bear the burdens of the sinful world? How long? You and I go, are going to be waiting and looking up onto that uh, skies and say, Lord, Lord, when are you going to come? Was done when Jesus Christ rose up to heaven. And all the people, all the disciples, they were looking into the skies. Oh, ye people of Galilee, why do you look into the skies? Why haste into the skies? This same Jesus who is taken up, will come again, is a promise. Locating the promise from Acts, the second chapter, and placing ourselves comfortably in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. We need to have a real study of identifying ourselves in that placement of looking at the new Jerusalem. Christ comes. Will I be privileged? And this is just before, just before or just after, you know, the millennium. Just after the millennium, this happens and what is the glorious part of this is the greatest city the pompous city the fabulous city that Jesus once said do not be discouraged you know there are a lot of mansions in heaven and I am going to prepare a place for all of you and then come back. For what? That I will take you into that city. God is very watchful. God is very careful. Because we need to identify certain things. Now what is this new Jerusalem? What is the old Jerusalem? What is this new earth? What is this old earth? What is in uh, old heavens? And what are the new heavens? There are a lot of things we need to care for. And the old things have now gone away. Passed away. Everything is rolled away. Everything is cleansed off. Everything is burnt off. Everything is sanctified off. And we come to the reality of looking into the pompous and the only one city that Jesus Christ can reign for ever and ever and ever 
And that eternity is going to come down. And that eternal city is coming down. We should read the second verse of John 21. I mean Revelation 21. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God, out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. What is an awaiting privilege who awaits for you know once I attended a marriage I do not know whether uh, this sign is given here for a marriage attendance because this morning I was standing outside our neighbor passed by he said is there a marriage today He asked me, our neighbor, who passed by when I was standing at the entrance, he asked, is there a marriage today? Then I said, uh, well, I don't know, but I'm here for Sabbath. <laughs> and he then in turn said, no, you wear a flower here. I said, uh, this I wear it on all Sabbath. So different notation, different ideology, but uh, I attended one marriage in my place in India. The bride was there. You know, usually, I don't know about the Western culture of marriage, but uh, our culture will be, first all the ministers will come to the stage and then the bridegroom, that is the boy, also will follow the ministers. And the boy will come and stand here. And then, I mean the bridegroom. And then the bride should march in from a different door. The bridegroom will march through the side door. But the bride will march through the front door, the main door. The galaxy of people should see and uh, the uh, bride will come from the middle gate. But that day, we all were on the stage. The bride is ready, but the groom was not ready. Bridegroom. And everybody said, the bridegroom is supposed to follow the ministers. Where is the bridegroom? We didn't know. <laughs> Truly, those who marched on the stage, we didn't know what happened to the bridegroom. And we went to the, you know, the uh, section, went to the uh, bridegroom's father and asked, where is the bridegroom? They're coming from the hotel. Wait, wait. The father also didn't know from where the bridegroom uh, should come. But the bride is waiting at the door from the stage. All the ministers, please come out. Because the bridegroom has not arrived. The whole people who came there to greet them and uh, make sure their attendance will make a a very happy moment on the day of their marriage day, the bridegroom didn't appear. And then we heard that the bridegroom, the bridegroom had an, a stomach pain. Okay? Appendicite. The bridegroom had an appendicite. And doctors where I, I mean, he was advised to take an immediate operation. The whole group is waiting at the church. The bride is standing at the gate. Ministers on the stage. But the bridegroom is supposed to take an operation. I do not know 
But the mother of the boy rushed to the lodge and said, called some uh, nurses and doctors and said, somehow make sure the boy attends a marriage. Somehow make sure that the boy attends a marriage. And the nurses and doctors said, if the thing bursts out, then he has to die. So please don't uh, trouble. You better stop the marriage. Tell the ministers to go home. Because we were on an agenda, itinerary, on the stage to perform the marriage. But after half an hour, the boy somehow got the courage. He withstood the pain because the bride was waiting. He withstood the pain and some medicines were given to him. Some uh, injections were given to him to make sure that he would bear the pain at least for an hour. And the marriage took place for another half an hour. The marriage took place. Everybody was curious to ask the bride. No, the marriage is not yet over. Your would-be is having a pain. They say he wants to have an operation. Beginning of your life is what? An operation. And you're going to have a marriage with him. Lot of people are discouraging him. Trying to, you know, uh, sidetrack her attention and uh, uh, thinking of another person. Yes, literally. Literally. Attraction to the world. New Jerusalem, that is Jesus Christ, the bridegroom who is going to come to meet the bride. At the last time, people discourage people. People distract people. People identify people with different problems and somehow see that the new Jerusalem should be stopped. That the marriage of the bride and the bridegroom should be stopped. And this is where the Lord says, And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of the heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned. What? For her husband. New Jerusalem has to come and take us. And that is the awaiting of the greatest moment that you and I as the Adventist Church, as the Seventh-day Sabbath keepers need to identify because we say that this Jerusalem is waiting or the Jerusalem is going to come to us and that we are awaiting and awaiting to see the bride, bridegroom come. We need to look into this. The richest city in the world. The most fabulous city of the world. The most engineered city or the fabricated city in the world is going to come. I think on Thursday, when we had our uh, union conference president meeting with us, we were given a dinner of all the speakers and then we left to London and uh, so one of my friends said, this street is the street which holds the costliest hotels in the world. Costliest hotels in the world. Some of the topmost hotels in the world. Some of the best dishes you get from this uh, you know, place. Whatever dishes from 
any corner of the world, if you want to have, you can enter here, they said. The New Jerusalem, which comes from heaven, is something that we need to understand that man cannot give description with words and phenomena. Man cannot describe with his own words because there are words that the Bible can only express. Because it is a new city and new Jerusalem and that the builder is Jesus Christ and it is not a builder who is man. The of all lords, the king of all kings and he is the overseer, not Nebuchadnezzar who said, oh this is the Jerusalem, I mean uh, Babylon, the greatest city which I designed and uh, you know built and the next moment what happened? He became an animal. So one cannot describe this new Jerusalem, but the Jerusalem city is the biggest, the fabulous, the most wonderful, because the architect of this building is Jesus Christ and no one else. We have an architect who designed this beautiful, marvelous, wonderful, glorious, and that's the eternal city. Eternal city. Any building on this earth is not going to be eternal. So to study the new Jerusalem, so the study of this new city, that is Jerusalem, and we also need to have an impressive idea, a mind that we need to accept that this city is the holiest city of the world. Which is the holy city of the world? Jerusalem now. Am I right? But the holiest of the holy is yet to come. We teach children, we say that which is the holy city of the world. We say Jerusalem. which is the toppest mountain in the world. He said the Himalayas. So there are uh, historical, geographical, physical map that we need to learn. But for this city, nobody under the sky can give a geographical study or an architectural study or an engineering mind which can describe the new Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You kill us the people, which was that Jerusalem. But that Jerusalem is a savior Jerusalem, which is to come and to save the people and to carry the joyous moment that we have suffered so far in reaching that eternal heaven. You know, this Jerusalem, before we need to understand, we need to understand through, you know, Milton, the greatest poet who wrote a poem on the paradise lost and the paradise regained. English poet. The paradise lost. Why was it lost? The reason for losing it. That was also established and that Garden of Eden, the glorious one, the prettiest one, and the enjoyable one, they had everything, everything, everything. And God didn't say, don't eat all of this and eat only this. But God said what? Eat all of them, but not only this. One exception, making sure that they can do anything in the Garden of Eden. But this new Jerusalem is not going to have any exceptions. It's not going to have any exceptions. Why? Because we need to understand that all the memories of this world is going to be gone away. All the sin of this world is going to be gone away. And the characteristics that we need to have 
to enter into this kingdom or enter into this new Jerusalem. The Jerusalem that is newly constructed and that is descending for us to be inhabited. To understand the characteristics of the new Jerusalem, the characteristics of people who entered into it, the characteristics of things that God has in new in that New Jerusalem. And uh, maybe looking into the construction, what is the size of the New Jerusalem? It is about 1,500 miles around. What is the size of the city? 1,500 miles and 375 miles of the side view. And the height of the wall is around 216 feet high. Is there any wall which is higher than this? Related to this? I do not know. The wonder of Jesus says the walls of Jerusalem is 216 feet high. And uh, if you want to read the materials that was used to construct this building, what kind of a material? Huh? Stone, sand, cement, gum, what? Water? All precious stones. I have not seen any of them. I have not seen any one of the precious stones. But God is talking about 12 precious stones. More valuable, astounding in price. Beautiful in sight and glorious to admire with. And so the city which is built on all precious stones for the precious souls. You and I are so precious in the sight of God. Precious stones are being built, are being, you know, uh, you know built everywhere. And that is a glorious look that is given. For the glorious people, that is you and I, who are going to enter into that. Looking into the strength of the people who will go inside, how many gates were there? Twelve gates for twelve tribes, individually, separately, identically who will get into the city on 12 sides, not on one door here, as I was talking about. The bride enters through the main gate, and the groom enters through the side gate. But here, what happens is, Jesus Christ, with that new glorious Jerusalem, is very much adorned. Come. And we have 12 imminent, marvelous, fabulous gates that are prepared that we go into it, representing the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And how many pillars were there? 12 gates? 12 pillars. Now these 12 pillars, they represent whom? The apostles. The 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. And they had pearls on it. And a marvelous sight to see every uh, you know, gate standing upon every pillar of the apostles. You and I are standing today on a pillar, on a building that is represented by the 12 tribes and by the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. And where we are going to be members of that great city. That foundation and the pillar is very, very important. <coughs> now the spirituality of the study of New Jerusalem is. Jesus Christ, when he finished his mission, 
dying on the cross, being raised into heaven. The same Jesus who was taken up, he will come back. Okay? And promised that he has prepared to, gone to prepare a place for us. He waited for how many years now? Near about 2,000 years. Look into the architecture of Jesus' time. Look into the architecture of the first century, of the second century. And now we are on to the 21st century. The archaeology, the architect, the uh, building structures, the genealogy, and uh, the engineering study of Jesus Christ had been waiting for this many years that even engineer was planning for the topmost hotel in the, the world. world. What stone he would use, what kind of a material he will use, and how would be the road, and how would be the streets, and how would be the country, you know, uh, buildings or houses and everything. Jesus was watching and studying the mind of men. If men and women want to have a house, a fabulous, a fantastic, an all modern uh, house on earth. So Jesus Christ has taken this many years to study the intellectuals of the worldly people to say that this would be the best of all the cities that men and women can construct on this earth. The glorious one. So you and I should uh, know that Jesus Christ has taken this many years as he has promised the Galileans, stating that he is gone to prepare a place for all of us. So, I do not know who live in the best houses that you have in England. Who lives? The queen. Yes. Queen of England lives in the best. How many of you have uh, seen that uh, uh, palace inside of it? Anyone who has gone in, I'm happy because I can say anything about my new city that is Jerusalem. Because you have nothing to say, so I can say anything, anything more that a man can talk about and talk about and think about and think about and uh, uh, say that the city that is going to come is going to be the world best, the scenario that you and I can see would be the best ever made city. I just went there. On the street, I was there to see. I also did not have a chance to get inside. And uh, somebody said, this is the Buckingham Palace. Fabulous from outside. Fabulous from outside. But what is going to be the inside of our great a city that God is going to come. Members, we need to have an imaginary mind in order to study about the New Jerusalem, the holy city, the one and one city which is going to come, that we are going to stay there for years and years and years together, not becoming old, not becoming sick, not becoming what jealous. Everyone is going to be privileged to be there and not going to say, this palace where our queen lives is the best. This palace or this office which our prime minister says is the best. We are not going to compare and contrast there. We are going to live in that glorious and the fabulous city that God has designed especially for you and me. Shall I say something about the city? The city is going to hold all the Christians of the world. Say amen. amen. Who I said? All the Christians of the world who are Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, who just believe that Jesus Christ came to this world, died for me, resurrected, he stood on behalf as a lawyer and convincing the father, please forgive my son, please forgive my daughter, please, please, and pleading, and that pleading is just going to end, 
and that Jesus is going to come and after the thousand years of reign and judging the people of the world, I think we are going to enter into that greatest city and that city that all of us are going to see and say what? Say what? High five. Am I right? You only said, we will say high five there. What a glorious privilege. And only all God's people are going to be there. They are not going to say, these people belong to England. These people belong to India. These people belong to Africa. No. No. Today we fight Hindus, Christians, Muslims, and whatever you want to call. But that city is going to hold whom? Christians. The followers of Jesus Christ. And you and I, who are specially called the remnant church, the last church, the Adventist church, which is waiting for Jesus Christ. And if you and I don't have a place to see that, I think we have lived a life that is wasted. Yes. A city with the pure Christians. Am I right? Pure followers of Jesus Christ. And it is a city that only God's people are there. No more satanic people. No more people leading to sin. No more people making to follow what? Spiritism, spiritualism, manism, and Pentecostalism, and Catholicism. All these things are not going to be there. Only what? Christians who follow Jesus Christ. And Christians who follow from Genesis to Revelation. Come on. It's it not, not Old Testament. But both Old Testament and New Testament need to be studied and followers of the Ten Commandments and uh, because they have been judged to enter into that uh, kingdom of heaven. You will see all kinds of nationality there. But what? But what? Are we going to be called as Indians? Are we all going to be called as Americans? Are we all going to be called as uh, Europeans? No. As I told you, the one word which should be pronounced from Jesus Christ's mouth would be, all those who waited for me, please come. And who all will be there, you know, specially? Only the Sabbath keepers will be there. Amen? Amen? Why? Why? If you want to meet Jesus Christ, yes, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. The New Jerusalem is a place where Jesus Christ is placed. And it is a New York that all of us are going to be there. And we are going to visit Jesus Christ once in a week, once in a month. And we are going to have that joyous day. It is not going to be the Sunday there. No. No. No Sunday worship there in heaven. That is why we are practicing here. That is why we are preaching here. That is why we are telling that the Bible says about the seventh day Sabbath. And there only the Sabbath keepers will be there. Because Jesus Christ who created this world and said on six days everything he created. And he rested on the Sabbath. He blessed the Sabbath. He sanctified it and gave it to the people and said you also follow. You also preach. You also teach. So that you can be with Jesus Christ in that holy city. In that new city with Jesus Christ. Observing the Sabbath forever and ever in this ever. world. Sabbath doesn't end in this world. It is an ongoing process. Sabbath is an eternal promise. Sabbath is an eternal command of the Lord. Because he is called as the Lord of the Sabbath. He cannot change it. He cannot, uh, you know, change it to another day. But you and I can make a change. If today I am sick, I can put a day off and work for another day. Am I right, sir? God doesn't does it. Because there is no sickness there. <laughs> there is no death there. There is no placement. There is no priority. Everyone is equal. And only the Sabbath keepers will be there. And do you all know, 
that we have a dual house. Do you all know that we have dual house? Two houses. One is the new Jerusalem and the other one is what? The new earth. Okay? Let's now compare one or two things about this. We are going to have a city house. Which is the city house? New Jerusalem. We are going to have a country house. Which is that? The new earth. Okay? A city house in New Jerusalem and a country house in the new earth and city that the home is built by Jesus Christ himself and the country house is going to be built by whom? Us. Yes. The city house is built by Jesus Christ and the country house or the village house we are going to make what? We are going to make home. And weekly worship where? New city. Understand? Yes. We are going to daily worship the Lord in our village or the country house. And once in a week, we are all going to go there. That is why we are gathered here. I see much of the people that I didn't see in the weekdays. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I didn't see this much. But here we are here. Why? Because this is the day that we need to worship the Lord in a week. Blessed Sabbath. Holy Sabbath. There are rivers in New Jerusalem. There are rivers in New Jerusalem. There are rivers in New Earth. The monthly visit, the monthly manna, the monthly food, where are we going to get? From New Jerusalem, the fruit of life. Every month, we will be given a fruit of life. From where? From the New Jerusalem. And we are going to eat, which will not give sickness, which will not give sin, which will not give jealousy, which will not give rebellious, which will not give anything that is sinful. Because that is a, a medicinal fruit, a spiritual fruit, a loyal fruit that is designed and grown in New Jerusalem which you cannot find anywhere in the world, which you cannot find the taste or the pride of that fruit anywhere in the world. The New Jerusalem is a replicate of the Garden of Eden before sin, not after sin. It was a replicate of Garden of Eden before sin because Everything was perfect. Everything was good. Everything God designed and gave. So my dear friends, I want to bring out three lessons, spiritual lessons, out of the New Jerusalem and the waiting of, waiting for the New Jerusalem. Number one, why I am an Adventist today and why I am proud of calling myself an Adventist and what is the reason I gather here today and what is the reason for me to read the Bible and the Ten Commandments to be followed exactly as it is written? And why it is because I need to know that this New Jerusalem is personally designed and constructed and formed by Jesus Christ himself. So the spiritual lesson I need to learn is that Jesus Christ is the constructor maker, designer, and former of this New Jerusalem. It is not the pastor, it is not uh, the uh, intellectuals of this earth. So I'm happy I'm going to enter where Jesus is. The church should be happy because we are extremely happy because it is an exceedingly beautiful city. The hills and the mountains, the ruggedness are all taken away. No slothful deserts in that new city. Graceful and lovely and delicate flowers greeted every eyes, that those who entered into it. It says, graceful and lovely, delicate flowers greeted the eyes of the entries who go inside. The trees were majestic. The walls were, I said what? 200 and? 
16 feet high. But the trees, majestic trees which grows, they are doubler and they were very tall, that which grows. The air was cleaner and helpful. So we don't have what? Air pollution. We don't have uh, water pollution. We don't have uh, people pollution, population. No pollution whatsoever because everyone is going to be given a place to live. And point number two that I need to learn from the New Jerusalem, that which will descend is. Jesus is going to be there with us. You know the earthly garden of Eden. We read, Jesus used to come in the evening. Am I right? In the morning, Adam and you used to what? In the morning and evening. But the rest of the time, what they would be doing? Cleaning, mending, repairing, and looking after the garden. And only in the morning and evening, who is to come? Jesus used to come. But here, no, going up and coming down. What is going to be the stay? Where is going to be the stay? In New Jerusalem forever and ever. So God is not going to up and leave the man to sin. God is not going to visit only in the morning as a supervisor visits in the morning. And as an accountant who comes in the evening to pay the salary, no, it is not going to be. Forever and ever, not like the Garden of Eden, that God went up and came down, and finally God had to ask him, Adam, Adam, where art thou? Whatever name is, God is simply there all 24 hours. Okay, God is not going to be separated. We are not going to be separated. Okay, we are not going to live in dark. We are going to be in the light. Though we say that uh, sun and moon are not there, but the presence of God itself makes it very clear that the law of the sun and moon works it out because in new earth we need to have. Yes. Yes. The separation came because who came? Satan. Now what happened to the Satan? He was tied for a thousand years and he was destroyed and there was an end and there is no more Satan's visit into the Garden of Eden or into the New Jerusalem. Only God and all of us are going to be there. No more Satanic intervention. No more Satanic work. No more sinful ways. No more, uh, you know, disobedience there. All obedient to one law and one God. Because what God says, I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. Everything that we depend and call God as eternity. And the third lesson that one should learn from this new Jerusalem is, it's a sanctified and a holy city. It's a sanctified and a holy city. When Moses was wanting to talk to God, or when God appeared before Moses, what did he say? Remove your shoes. Take away your shoes. Why? The place where you stand is holy. You are talking to a holy God. You are in the presence of the holy God. So when God is present, that place becomes holy. That place becomes the holiest of holy. That we cannot have a sinful thought in it. And so this new city, this new Jerusalem is the holiest of all holy. And that is where the holiest God lives. And whereby only the holiness stays and no more. My dear friends, today you are called by Mr. Mrs. Doctor, nurse, pastor. There, how are we going to call? The saints. The saints. What a glorious name we are going to have. The saints of the world are going to occupy the new Jerusalem. All of us are going to be called as saints. Sinless. They will have no sinful thought. They will have no any idea of what is disobedience is all about. 
All of us, you and I, you want to know? You will be called a saint. I will be called a saint. A saintful life, not a shameful life. A saintful life. That's called as the New Jerusalem. Our sins were washed away. All our infirmities have washed away. And the thing is, which makes us all holy and righteous, because still what prevails there? The Ten Commandments prevails there. We say the sanctuary on earth is what? The shadow of heavenly sanctuary. The law of God is the law of heaven. And so the Ten Commandment keepers, because why I preach is today, we are Ten Commandments keepers, we are Sabbath keepers, we are followers of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And so we can 100% say that we follow the word of God and we can surely enter into that holiest city. You and I can find the memorials of the 12 tribes. The memories, the memorial. You come to India, the capital of India is Delhi. You can see some of the memorials of all the great freedom fighters. But there, nobody is going to be called as what? Freedom fighters or anybody. But what they will have is the memorials of the 12 tribes will be there. And the memorial of the 12 apostles will be there. And all of us will be equal in the city. And never has such a city that was built upon the earth in the sight of God as equality. No, unequality or inequality. Everybody is going to be called equal citizens. And so that is a glorious thing. We need to have some imagination, I said. Just imagine about how glorious, how brightful our life is going to be. Yes, my life. A transformed life, a holy life. You know, my dear uh, brothers and sisters, that's an opportunity for having obeyed his commandments, for having attended the seventh day Sabbath, for having keeping the Ten Commandments of God. And that's a glorious gift that God wants to give it to each of us. May we all have that great privilege of being in that holy city, a wonderful city, marvelous city. <clears throat> if I ask, have you seen uh, Queen Elizabeth? Some may say yes. But I will ask you one thing. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? On that glorious day, on that glorious city, we are going to see Jesus Christ. Thomas, St. Thomas, he put his hand here and touched. He felt and then said, now Lord, I will understand. He put his hand into the left side of his rib and said, now Lord, I can understand. But my dear brothers and sisters, none of us are going to say that identifying. Identify. No identification there. All are going to be happy and we are going to be the happiest people on earth. May the Lord richly bless all of us that we are on that place, on the platform of cherishing that eternal new holy city. We call it as New Jerusalem. May we all take a promise today. Take a vow. Lord, if I should be there in that holy city, what should I do? Should I put away my sins? Should I come to you and get pardon and forgiveness of sin? Should I, Lord, obey your commands and be a member of that holy city? If one of you want to say, or any one of you want to say, I would like to submit myself into the hands of God, accepting and making a vow before the Lord should take us to that glorious day if Jesus comes this night. If this night is going to be his return, we will all be privileged to have that participation in the first what? Resurrection. And no part in the second death. 
You understand? Participation in the first resurrection and no part in the second death. Being glorious, upheld by Jesus Christ into that holy city. Maybe all, if you say that you want to be in heaven, in that holy city, I would like to make a special prayer that God will bless us and take us to that eternal heaven. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you that I am making this command or this vow or this promise to give away, to take away all what is evil and that Jesus Christ's righteousness should be placed on me. That we, when Jesus Christ comes to this earth in that new Jerusalem, may I, may we, may all of us who are seated, may we cherish to say that anyone who is brought into the church fold from now on will be also taken into that great city, New Jerusalem. Help us that we be loyal and faithful until your return. This we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.